Well, good afternoon, folks. Welcome to uh, the Bullpen Theater. We also want to welcome those of you joining us on Facebook Live for today's author series. Uh, my name is Bruce Marcus, and I work in the Education Department here at the Hall. It's my privilege to uh, introduce each of our authors throughout the year. It's hard to believe we only have uh, three author series programs remaining, including uh, our guest today, and his name is Scott Longert. Scott has written the book Victory on Two Fronts, uh, really looking at the Cleveland Indians, how they were affected uh, by World War II, um, many of their key players serving in the military, but then also how they kind of recovered after the war. The players came back and the team eventually did win a championship. It was also a time of integration. Scott explores all of these uh, themes. Uh, this is Scott's uh, sixth book. Uh, he is really considered the leading expert on uh, Cleveland Indians slash Guardians baseball. Uh, he's followed the uh, history of the franchise over the years. Uh, so we'll be doing a presentation for you. Uh, we'll take some questions uh, from the audience members here in the theater afterward, and then we'll head out into the library atrium for a book signing. Uh, but without further ado, please join me in welcoming to the Hall of Fame author series, Scott Longer. Scott. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you very much. And good afternoon, everybody. It's, it's really an honor to be here at the Baseball Hall of Fame. It's just a hard to mention in words what it's like to be speaking here. I've been doing presentations for about 25, 30 years now. I've spoken at libraries and meeting halls and different auditoriums, even on baseball fields. But this is really a privilege to be here to speak about my book, Victory on Two Fronts. It's really a, really a dream come true. And if you see me smiling throughout, it's not because I thought of some kind of joke. It's just because I'm just so happy to be here to speak at, uh, at the greatest place around for baseball for uh, forever and, and going forward. I am from Cleveland. And uh, it's been a great year. Cleveland Guardians, a very young team with a lot of young players with very little experience. However, they are in first place when uh, we left Monday night. I think they still are, and they're in great position. They may not win the division, but they're in great shape for wild card. And I think that something a bit unexpected. We thought we might have a competitive team, but they've been doing outstanding, and it's just been great to watch them. And I'm hoping come September and October, we can watch them a little bit more and see them get in the playoffs and uh, and do some damage there. As I mentioned, it's been great for Cleveland. Uh, Jack Rainey was inducted. He got the Ford Frick Award for Excellence in Broadcasting. He was a Cleveland broadcaster from the early 30s through the 1950s, a former ball player for the Cleveland Naps, and an all-around terrific announcer. So glad to, to see that happen. But not everything has been, has been wonderful for Cleveland at all. Today, unfortunately is the 102nd anniversary of the death of Ray Chapman. He died in a New York hospital that time ago, and it was just a tragedy for everyone. He was hit in the side of the head, his skull was fractured, and he died while doctors tried to save him. I'm sure back in Cleveland, at Lakeview Cemetery, really one of the great cemeteries that we have in, in Cleveland and, and anywhere around the country, there are people at Ray's gravesite right now dropping off baseballs and bats and gloves as people have been doing that for many, many years. It's really become a tradition in Cleveland and hopefully will go on for a long, long time so Ray will not be forgotten. I thought I'd start out with a, a Bob Feller story. I always like to tell one about Bob. In, uh, when he was in his 70s and 80s, he was a little bit gruff and uh, abrupt and uh, but if you got by that he would talk baseball to you be a really nice guy somebody really liked to me there was a husband and wife that uh, played high school baseball and they decided after they got married to go to the cleveland baseball fantasy camp they held in lakeland florida and bob was a participant he was one of the alumni even in the 70s and 80s he'd always pitch the first inning of the alumni in camp or game so the husband and wife went to camp, and the husband was just amazed that he got to talk to and see the great Bob Feller. It was time for the alumni and the camper game. Bob went out and pitched the first inning, got all three guys out, as he usually did. He walked back to the bench, and this young man just couldn't believe at all. He hadn't gotten a game yet. He said, Mr. Feller, do you mind if you and I could play catch for a few minutes? And Bob kind of looked at him and said, well, all right. And he got up, and they walked down the right field line about 20 feet and got apart. 
And the young man had the baseball. He was so nervous, he's going to actually throw to Bob Feller. The ball slipped out of his hand, went about five feet over Feller's head down the right field line. This young man was horrified at what he did. He said, oh, Mr. Feller, I'm so sorry. I'll get the baseball. I'll get the ball. And Bob turned to him and said, you're damn right you will. <laughs> <laughs> that was Bob back then, but he was great. I got to see him pitch one inning in a fantasy camp. The first two guys, he struck out. The third guy hit a little dribbler, and that was it. He kind of walked off the field like, that's how you do it. Everybody was in awe of watching him perform. Now, 1941, in the fall, there was a lot of concern around the United States all about what was going to happen with the impending war overseas. It wasn't a matter of if we were going to fight, it was a matter of when. That meant hundreds of thousands of families were going to be separated. Husbands and brothers and fathers and cousins were going to be drafted or they're going to enlist in the Army or the Navy. They would be gone for a year, two years, three years, nobody really knew. And of course, a number of them wouldn't be coming back home. A number of those would come back wounded, and they wouldn't be the same after serving overseas. There was a lot of anxiety and uncertainty about when this would happen. The fall of 1941 in Cleveland, there was that same uncertainty and anxiety, but there was something else going on. The Cleveland Indians needed a new manager. In 1941, Roger Peckinpah had been the manager, but he was moved up to the front office by the owner, Alpha Bradley who wanted Peck in the front office because he was very good with managing people and doing contracts and finding new talent. So a manager was needed for the 42 season. Well, not a, candidate, a lot of candidates came forward. Lou Boudreau was one of those, which was a big surprise. He was 24 years old, the starting shortstop, but he had no managerial experience. The best he had was in college, where he was captain of the Illinois basketball team. But Lou decided to apply for the job anyways. He was mature thought he could handle the job, and he went forward. After he sent the letter to Mr. Bradley, he told his friends that, I think that was a mistake. I'm too young. I've never managed. You know, I probably shouldn't have done it. I wish I could get that letter back. And they told him, not to worry. You'll get a letter back from Mr. Bradley. You'll say, Lou, thank you very much. We appreciate it. But we're moving in a different direction, and then we'll see you in spring training. Oh, yeah, that's probably it. And didn't think much more about it. But in Cleveland, the shareholders were meeting with Mr. Bradley, the owner, and talking about things. And one of the shareholders was president of Sherwin-Williams, and he had a lot of shares of stock. And he said, I'd like to see us go in a different direction. I'd like to see us get somebody young with fresh ideas and some youth. We always hire guys that have been in the game for 30 years or more. They've been a player, coach, and manager. But let's get some new blood in here. And the more he talked, the more persuasive he was. And Lou was shocked to get a letter from Mr. Bradley, not thanking him for his interest, but saying, we'd like you to come to Cleveland in late October, interview for the job. Well, Lou came to Cleveland all excited. He interviewed very, very well. And a few days later, the announcement hit all the papers in Cleveland that Lou Boudreau is now the player manager for the Cleveland Indians. He was interviewed. He said all the right things about, we're going to hustle. We're going to fight. We're going to scrap for runs. We're not the best team in baseball, but we're going to try hard. We're going to be out there. And you're going to be proud of us. But he had the, a couple of weapons. He had Bob Feller, who would probably win 25 ball games probably strike out 200 people or more. And with starting with him, he had something of a lineup. However, on December 7th, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. The war was declared. The United States would be fighting in Germany, around Eastern Europe, and in the South Pacific. And all those men would be going overseas, including a lot of baseball players. Guys would be leaving. One of the first to go was Bob Feller, who enlisted in the Navy just days after the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. Everybody knew Bob would be gone for at least two years, three years, possibly more. This made things really tough for Lou Boudreau. All he had for pitchers was Mel Harder, who had been a pretty good pitcher, but Mel had elbow surgery. And back in the late 30s and early 40s, that was very experimental. Nobody knew if he could recover and come back and pitch. Other than that, all there was was some pitchers who were 500 guys, like Al Milner and Al Smith, guys who would count on to pitch regularly but couldn't win a lot of ball games. So Lou had his work cut out for him to go ahead in 1942. He did have Jeff Heath in the outfield. Jeff was a veteran, good ball player. He could hit, he could run, drive in runs, an excellent fielder. But Jeff had a problem. He was very difficult to manage, had a very bad temper. Just a couple of years back, he'd gone up to manager Oscar Vitt 
take a bat with him and said, one more word out of you, I'm going to crack this over your head, which was total insubordination. He went in the stands and punched a fan at one time. He threw his bat, hit the top of the dugout, went into the seats, and hit Louis Seltzer, the editor of the Cleveland Press, right in the shoulder. And he got in a fight in the middle of the dugout where everybody could see with Johnny Broca, a teammate of his, who was a boxer at Yale. You have these two heavyweights fighting in the dugout. Nobody wanted to separate them. They didn't want to get in between to get knocked down by one of the two. Jeff was very difficult, but he was a very good ball player when he wanted to be. And he needed veterans like that that Lou would have to try and keep somehow in, in check. We had a center fielder named Roy Weatherly, whose nickname was Stormy. And it wasn't because of his last name. It was because of his personality. September of 41, he was suspended by Roger Peckinpah for the remainder of the season for insubordination. So Lou had to deal with those guys and try and put a team together. Now Lou would do all the right things. They would get to training camp and uh, he'd work with the ball players. Again, he's 24 years old and everybody else is probably a lot older than him, but he still worked very hard. He went over the guys with the signs that he would have for the ball club. He told everybody, the sign for stealing is, I'm going to pretend I have a cold, I'm going to pretend to sneeze and then blow my nose and that means to go on the next pitch. The guy said, all right, got over. Well, about the third exhibition game, there were runners on first and second for Cleveland. The runner on second was one of the catchers, a very slow runner. Lou was on the bench. He was getting a head cold. Out of nowhere, he sneezed real loud. He instinctively pulled out his handkerchief, blew his nose. On the next pitch, the runners took off. The guy in second was thrown out by 10 feet. Everybody on the bench fell over laughing. They couldn't believe what happened. <laughs> Even Lou had to laugh, too, about it. Later, he would tell reporters that, uh, yeah, I'm going to have to change that signal. It wasn't a good idea. But the good thing was, everybody was paying attention. They were. <laughs> the season would then begin. Now, Fowler was at Norfolk, Virginia, at the naval base there, training in uh, March and April. He talked to some of his superiors, and they told him, you're probably not going to ship out until September, possibly even October. Bob was training to be a gunner, and he would serve on the USS Alabama for the duration of the war out in the South Pacific. So Bob had an idea. He wrote a letter to, to Mr. Bradley in Cleveland and said, what about having an Armed Forces All-Star Game at Municipal Stadium at night, maybe sometime in July? I can put together an All-Star team of guys from the major leagues that are in the Army and the Navy with me. We can come to Cleveland and play the American League All-Stars or the National League All-Stars, and all the money will go to the War Relief Fund that was just being set up for soldiers killed in battle for their families and for soldiers who are seriously wounded. Bradley thought it was a great idea. He went around Cleveland promoting the idea, selling as many tickets as he could. When game time was around, July 7th, there were 42,000 tickets sold, which was a terrific amount for a municipal stadium. But there was a huge run-up for tickets an hour before the game. And by game time, 62,000 people were in the stands at Municipal Stadium. They raised $130,000 for war relief, distributed to all those families that needed them. Feller did a tremendous thing in putting this together. It was probably the best sporting event to date, raising money for the cause. A lot of cities took note and tried to do similar things. Now that's Bob second from the right with the big M over his right chest there. On the far end is Frankie Pitlack, the catcher for Cleveland in the late 30s who caught Bob. Cecil Travis, a great shortstop for Washington, was on this team. Johnny Sturm, first baseman for the Yankees, was playing here. And the outfield was Pat Mullen, an outfielder for the Detroit Tigers. The pitchers were Feller, Johnny Rigney from the White Sox, who had pitched at all during spring training and uh, was in fairly good shape. And then Mickey Harris was the uh, finishing pitcher, the closer. Harris was flown in all the way from the Panama Canal Zone by the Navy just so he could pitch in this game and help raise money. It was a wonderful thing they did, and really was a big help to get things going. Feller pitched two innings, got hit pretty hard. His old teammate, Ken Keltner, had a triple offer for a couple of runs. When he left the mound, he got a standing ovation from 62,000 people, knowing they probably wouldn't see him again for many, many years. During the early part of the season, air raid drills were held at various stadiums, mostly around the East Coast, Boston, New York, and Brooklyn. There actually was some concern that somehow the Luftwaffe would find its way to the East Coast and attack the stadiums at night when there's 30, 40,000 people there. There's so much concern that drills were held at all these stadiums. There would be air marshals hired, they would patrol the roof, 
they'd have barrels of water up there and sandbags, and they have binoculars looking at the skies to look for any fighter planes that might come their way. In Boston, at Fenway Park, they taped instructions on all the seats. So if the siren went off, you'd look at that, take a look at that paper and see what I'm supposed to do, where I'm supposed to go. Now in Cleveland, you have to think that maybe somehow, I don't think it's true or it could happen, planes could reach these coasts. But then they'd have 700 miles to go to Cleveland to get to Municipal Stadium, which is like, I don't know how that could happen, but it, they did have a drill at Cleveland Stadium. A lot of fire trucks were there, men on the roof, and they were able to cut the lights in about a minute, which is a really fast time to cut all the stadium lights off. And it went very well. Everyone was in the dark, but people laughed and talked to one another. People applauded. In the middle of it, someone decided to light a cigarette. You could see that light all over. He got about 10,000 boos all over until he quickly put out the cigarette and waited until the lights came back. This was a real concern during 1942, and people took it seriously. But for us, luckily, nothing happened at all. Everyone who went to a ball game returned home safely. In September of 1942, the Indians decided to bring up Allie Reynolds and test him out as a starting pitcher. He was their best prospect they had in the minor leagues. And Allie was a graduate of Oklahoma State University. He started football, track, and baseball there, was an all-around athlete. And in one football game, he took a handoff on his own one-yard line, broke several tackles, took off in the secondary, turned on the speed, went 99 yards for a touchdown. This was noted all around the country, and when draft time came for the NFL, he was drafted by the New York Giants to play football. But Allie wanted to be a baseball player. He waited, the Cleveland Indians came by and offered him a contract. He spent two years in the minor leagues, he was brought up in September, to see what he could do as a possible replacement for Bob Feller. Now the one thing about Allie, which quickly became noted as soon as he joined the team, he was a member of the Creek Nation. He was Native American. And within days, his nickname mm -hmm. became Chief or Super Chief. That was society back then. If you were Native American, your nickname became Chief. There were several in the major leagues. Before him was Chief Bender and Chief Myers. There was an outfielder, a very good ball player named Bob Johnson, who was called Indian Bob because of his heritage. Now, Allie was trying to pitch, trying to be soft-spoken, but sometimes he'd get riled up. If somebody was getting on and calling him all kinds of names, he would stop, go up to that person and say, you called me that name several times already. I just want to let you know that if you call me that name again, you and I are going to have a serious conversation. What he meant was we're going to have a fight. And most people would back away and leave him alone. It would take a little while, but people would come to accept Allie. He's just a regular guy and a great pitcher. He would start for Cleveland for some years, but in 46, he would be traded to the New York Yankees for Joe Gordon, as the Indians were desperate for a second baseman. Allie would go to New York, win seven World Series games in his career, be a five-time All-Star, and in one season, pitch two no-hitters, one against Cleveland and Bob Feller. Really one of the great pitchers. If they found a way from the remaining Cleveland, our 48 lineup of pitchers would have been Feller, Lemon, Bearden and Allie Reynolds. I mean, very tough to beat, but it was not to be. But in his time with Cleveland, he did a great job for us. When spring training rolled around in 1943, the War Department and the War Transportation Board issued an order that major league teams had to train in the Midwest. They could not go any further than the Potomac River out of Virginia and Washington, D.C., or they could train on the East Coast. The reason was, Trains were needed to transport soldiers. They didn't want these teams going to Florida and California, using up all the fuel and using up space on the trains. They had to basically train where they were. Six teams trained in Indiana in 1943, among them the Cleveland Indians, who trained at Purdue University at the field house. They had to stay inside for most of the time because we know the Midwest and the East Coast weather in early March is not the greatest. The temperature might be 38 degrees, but man, freezing rain and sleet, it was awful. In one year, Cleveland was able to play only eight exhibition games before the season started because the weather was so bad they could not go outside. Some of the pitchers got one start, that was it. Then they had to go to the regular season, which was really difficult. That's how spring training was in 1943. Players had to get permission to travel away from their sites. If there are any games scheduled more than 25 miles out of your home base, you had to get permission from Major League Baseball and from the War Department to travel. It's 
very difficult traveling by buses. There were very few cabs because most people were overseas or in the Army or the Navy, but they had to make do with spring training in 43, 44, and 45. And somehow they got through it and had a major league season. The pitcher you see there for Cleveland is Mike Namick. He looks like a big guy, and he is. He's six foot seven, a relief pitcher. He was exempt from service in the Army because you couldn't have a six foot seven soldier jumping out of a foxhole and be a target like that. So he was excused from service, and he pitched for Cleveland in the early 40s. Not the greatest pitcher, but probably the biggest pitcher in baseball at the time. In 1943, a number of guys got a chance to play ball who really wouldn't have got the same chance had there not been a war. By war's end, over 500 major leaguers went into the armed forces, more than 1,000 minor leaguers, so players were scarce and hard to find. Cleveland found one of those guys to play. He was in the minors and was moving up. His name was Pat Seary. Everyone called him the people's choice because he loved to smoke cigars, loved to drink beer. He was about 5'10", 225 pounds. If you look, you'll see how big his arms are. He could hit home runs 450 feet, 475 feet. But the problem was he struck out almost every single game. He just could not make contact other than hitting a home run. That kept him in the minors. But in 43, the Indians were willing to take a chance on Pat. He became a regular outfielder. And in Cleveland, he did the same thing. He did some tremendous home runs in the upper deck that he'd strike out three times. This went on for three or four years. And by that time, the team got tired because he would strike out 130, 140 times a year. Today, that's all right. He could be a designated hitter, who probably hit about 30, 35 homers. They wouldn't mind the strikeouts, but in the 40s, that was way too much. Striking out of 100 times was too much. So Pat got traded to the Chicago White Sox. But it was there he made baseball history. In a game at Comiskey Park, Pat came to the plate, first time up, hit a long home run, followed up with a second home run, then a third. He came up for the fourth time, and everybody is standing. Could he possibly hit four home runs in a single game? Pat took a pitch, swung the next one. Tremendous blast way over the left field wall at Comiskey Park. He had made baseball history, only the fifth man ever to hit four consecutive home runs in a baseball game. The others were Luke Garrett, the great Hall of Famer everybody knew, Chuck Klein from the Phillies, who's a Hall of Famer, a great home run hitter. Then you have to go back to the turn of the century to Ed Delahanty, who played in the 1890s and early 1900s before he tragically died. He did it. And then in the 1880s, Bobby Lowe, playing for Boston, did four homers in a row. So Pat was in select company for the rest of his life, People would remember him and say, you're the guy that hit the four home runs in a game. He'd say, yes, I am. He was out of baseball by 1949 because of all the strikeouts. But in his day, people got to see some tremendous home runs from him. In the minor leagues, he hit some home runs over the parking lots, and he would hit buildings with them. That's how far he'd get at baseball. But he couldn't make contact enough, and that was the end for Pat. Major League Baseball did everything they could to raise money for the war effort every single way, for the soldiers, for the USO, for the Red Cross. And people in New York came up with a great idea. Some CEOs and bankers and men that own manufacturing companies, they decided to hold an auction. In this auction, they would buy a particular ball player from the Yankees, the Giants, or from Brooklyn, and they would pay war bonds to get them. And once this was done, they would follow the player in the course of the season. For instance, if that player would get a base hit, they would put in another $2,500 of war bonds. If he had a home run, another $10,000. For a pitcher, $35,000 for a win and $50,000 for a shutout. Just in buying ball players at auction, they raised $123,000 and then hundreds of thousands more during the course of the season. Major League Baseball also came up with the bat and ball fund. This was an effort to get baseballs and bats and gloves to the troops overseas so they could play ball when they had a chance. There was a kit A with the baseballs, the gloves, and the bats, and kit B that complete catcher's equipment. They would send thousands of these out to the South Pacific and to Europe. And when soldiers actually had a few moments in a lull, there wasn't going to be any action. They'd quickly form a couple of teams, and they would play baseball. There was an instance overseas in uh, the South Pacific. The Marines had cleared out the Japanese from a small island. They were gone. They'd taken over. The sailors came ashore, and the Marines showed them a brand new baseball field the Japanese soldiers had probably built just weeks before to play on. 
So they saw this field, they called all their buddies, and within minutes, there were games going on all day and the next day with hundreds of guys getting to play ball, courtesy of the Japanese for treating and uh, leaving them the baseball field. You see picture here on the left is Arky Vaughn for the Brooklyn Dodgers. He went for $11,000 in war bonds. And by contrast, Joe Gordon for the Yankees was $3,000. It was a terrific effort. Baseball really went out of its way to help Major League Baseball in all the years during the war. The turning point, World War II, was D-Day, June 6, 1944, when the Allies invaded the beachhead there. It's a three-pronged assault with the Americans, Canadians, and British all coming ashore at once and taking control of the beach. This was organized by General Eisenhower, who did a brilliant job of organizing this. There were hundreds of thousands of soldiers, hundreds of planes, and ships all coordinated at the same time to make this attack happen. And even though the beach was taken in just a few days, it was very difficult because there was still German activity around. They built these uh, casements out of, a, out of concrete. They were impossible to explode, to blow up. They had cannon inside and machine guns. And they kept up the fire for days and days over a couple of weeks until these soldiers ran out of food and they were starving. They eventually surrendered. Then the beach was totally secured. Troops could move inland to liberate Paris the following August. But everybody knew this was the turning point in Europe. The German army was on the run. And there were better days ahead, certainly coming. In the fall of 1944, the only commissioner baseball ever had, Judge Kennesaw Mountain Landis, passed away in his late 70s. Just a few weeks before he died, Major League Baseball had given him a new contract for $65,000 a year over the course of three years. He was a sick man, unfortunately, he passed away. Major League Baseball had no idea what to do without Landis. He took the job in 1920, all the way through 1944. He ruled with an iron hand. His decisions were always final. He demanded the owners listen to what he had to say. Now they had to find a replacement. They didn't have anyone in mind. So a search went on over the winter of 44 and into 45. One of the names that came up I thought was very, very interesting that was J. Edgar Hoover, the boss of the FBI. His name came up as a candidate. You have to wonder, well, what would have happened if they hired J. Edgar Hoover? Would he put wiretaps on the players' phones? Would he have snooped around and had guys in the clubhouses? Yeah, Nobody absolutely. knows. Fortunately, <laughs> after a month, his name was withdrawn and uh, it went elsewhere. In April, Albert Happy Chandler, the senator from Kentucky, was mm -hmm. the new baseball commissioner. He would have a five-year deal, and he would be the guy to get baseball back in shape after 1945 and the players coming home and bringing baseball forward into the 1950s. He was a guy that could get things done. He was a Washington insider. He could reach across the aisle, and he was a logical choice to run baseball from 1945 forward. In April of 45, unexpectedly, Bob Feldman returned home to the United States after serving three and a half years overseas. His tour of duty was not over, but he was called back to the Great Lakes Naval Training Center in Chicago where he would finish out his enlistment. Back in those days, you had to have a certain amount of points accumulated to get out, and Fellow was very close to it, so his tour ended in the South Pacific, and he came back home. Feller managed the baseball team there while he waited, and he did some pitching. He pitched against the University of Richmond, pitched about five or six innings, gave up two hits, struck out a bunch of guys, and afterwards, all the reporters flocked up to the University of Richmond coach, said to him, what did you guys think of Bob Feller? They turned to him and said, we don't know, we haven't seen the ball yet. <laughs> so everybody knew Bob, even though he'd been gone that long, he still could throw. He returned home in August to Cleveland. After one day, he started against the Detroit Tigers at night at Municipal Stadium. Over 50,000 people were there. Bob went nine innings, struck out 12. They won the game four to two after a three and a half year absence. Phenomenal. He went five more games in September and be ready for 1946. Just, just amazing what he was able to do. The same month of April 1945, however, President Roosevelt passed away. He had a cerebral hemorrhage in Warm Springs, Georgia, and he was gone. He'd been a great friend to baseball in his years in the presidency, particularly the fall of 41 going into 42. But a number of owners approached him and said, should we even play baseball? Should we just cancel baseball till the war is over? And Roosevelt told him, go ahead. This is a good outlet for people who are worrying about their husband or brother overseas. They're working at all the war plants. It'd be a good idea for them to take a couple hours off, 
see a baseball game, have a hot dog and a soft drink, and forget about their troubles for a while. I think baseball should continue. The owners decided, okay, we'll go ahead, and baseball continued. Just a few weeks before his death, Roosevelt was given his season's pass for 1945, and he told the folks that, I will be there for opening day to throw out the first ball. But unfortunately, he passed away, and uh, that was the end of his reign, which was very unfortunate, a really good friend of baseball. Big surprise in 46, after the war had ended in June, Bill Beck was announced as the new owner of the Cleveland Indians. The best part about it was the team wasn't for sale. But Beck was a smart guy. He'd been a Marine during the war. He'd been injured badly. Machine gun placement fell on his leg and crushed it. He'd have 18 surgeries and lose his leg up to his knee eventually. He'd been in baseball before for many, many years and decided he wanted to get a major league team. He found out but Alvin Bradley only owned 25% of the Cleveland Indians' stock. Other shareholders had the balance. So he came to Cleveland quietly, didn't say his name or anything, went to the stockholders, and one by one offered to buy their stock until he owned a controlling interest in the team. He could buy Bradley out. He did this quietly. Bradley never knew what was happening. People came to him and said, there's rumors someone's trying to buy your ball club. And he would laugh and say, that's nonsense. No one's approached me. The team is not for sale. But a few days before the actual sale took place, the Sherwin family, who owned a bulk of the stock, contacted Mr. Bradley and told him Bill Beck is about to buy the team. He was stunned. He couldn't believe it. He called the meeting of all of his shareholders, had them together, and said, I'm shocked by this. I didn't know. I wish you would have come to me first. He said, I'm prepared to buy all of you out, to buy 100% of the stock. All I ask is you give me a few months to raise the money. I'll definitely do it, but it's going to take a few months. The shareholders met and decided they were going to go with Bill Beck because he came to them first, and Bradley was forced to sell his shares to Beck and be out of baseball. The only time the two of them met was when they sat down at a table to sign the papers. That was it. So it was really kind of underhanded by Beck to do this. Never went face to face to Bradley and said, I'm trying to buy your ball club, just warning you in advance, I'm going to try and take it from you. But he didn't. And it was really sad for Bradley. He had the team for over 20 years, nearly won a pennant in 1940. He brought in great ball players like Feller and Harder, and Lou Boudreau, and Ken Keltner. In the minor leagues in 1946 for the Indians was a promising third baseman named Al Rosen, also a great outfielder named Dale Mitchell, and a pitcher from Southern California named Mike Garcia. So the cupboard wasn't bare. Beck had a lot to work with, but he was a guy that was a real go-getter. He would do anything at all to sell a ticket. He'd go stay up till 3 in the morning to convince people to buy season tickets if necessary. He'd get up at 7 o'clock, four hours later, get right back to it. He'd speak to groups, talk 20 people or groups of 500, didn't matter. He'd do everything he could to buy tickets and promote the team. It started to work in 1947 as bigger crowds came to the stadium at night. One of the reasons was fireworks. He started doing that. That really excited people. He made a family thing where there would be musicians strolling around, Bands would be acrobats, all kinds of people doing things that made it interesting for people. And he was being successful, more and more crowds were coming, but some people would tell him he always go out the street to talk to people, and they would say, Mr. Beck, my husband and I really want to come to the game, but we have two young children, and we can't just bring them to the game. And a few days later, he announced he was opening up a nursery at Cleveland Municipal Stadium. You could bring your child, register them there, there'd be a nurse and several child care workers would take care of your kids after the game you'd pick them up. This took off right away, more and more attendance came, where Beck would take little kids, they were like two years old, they put in one area, three and four year olds in another, and five and six year olds somewhere else. They'd have bicycles for the older kids to ride, tricycles, dolls for little girls to play with, and baby carriages. It was a big success, so much so, in a big series with the Yankees a bit later on, there were 500 children in the nursery. I think that record probably still stands today. I don't think anyone else does that. But that was typical of Bill Beck and all his promotions he would do to make the Indians more accessible and get people to stand. And it worked. In Sunday ball games, holiday games, Friday nights, 50,000 was not a big deal. 60,000, 65,000, night after night, until in 48, he would break the all-time attendance record by having over 2 million people come to see Indians baseball games. Beck was not just comfortable with doing that. He watched closely when Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier. And he decided he was going to integrate the Cleveland Indians. And he thought closely about it. He thought very much that I don't want just a player for attention. 
I want a really good ball player, one of the best around. He hired a load of people just to go around to the old Negro Leagues, watch every ball player, and come back with a report. And it wasn't unanimous, but the large majority said the best player out there is Larry Doby, playing for the Newark Eagles. So if Beck didn't hesitate, he called the owner of the team and made an offer, was able to buy his contract. I'm sure Larry was quite shocked when he got a phone call in the morning telling him he was now a member of the Cleveland Indians. He had one day to get his things together, to pack. A representative from the team came to greet him, and they would go to Chicago where Cleveland was playing, and that's where he would see his first action. He got to Chicago, met briefly with Beck, and they talked. And Larry understood very well that to break the color barrier here, he has got to be quiet and humble. No matter what anybody says to him, no matter how terrible things they say, he cannot answer, he cannot fight back. He has to prove that black ball players belong in the major leagues. Larry was the man for the job. He understood what it took, and he did it. Despite not being able to go to hotels with his teammates, go out to dinner with them, or go to nightclubs, he always had to go somewhere else, or just simply stay home. Some of the guys on his own team were very hostile towards him. There was more than a few that, excuse me, when he was introduced, would not shake his hand. Others just turned their backs on him. Others rolled their hand like that. His own teammates, he had to overcome that. Of course, Bob Feller didn't mind, because Feller had been barnstorming with Satchel Paige and his all-star, so he just wanted good ball players on the team. Others were very friendly. Jim Geegan, our catcher, was friendly to Larry. Steve Gromack, our fifth starter, was very friendly to him. And Joe Gordon, as well. Joe would play catch with Larry before the ball game. So he did have some people, Bob Lemon, as well, who would talk to him and try and make him feel comfortable, even joke with him. The girl Mac and Egan like to do, they'd be in the clubhouse getting dressed or after a game putting on their street clothes. And the phone might ring in the clubhouse, and one would yell, Hey, Larry, it's Lena Horn calling. She's looking for you. <laughs> Lena Horn, beautiful actress and singer. He would laugh, and everybody would laugh. It would take a while for Dolby because he would wreak all kind of hostility everywhere he went. Guys spitting on him, yelling things about his wife, all kinds of awful things. But he persevered and proved himself to be one of the best ball players in baseball and a big help to the ball club. The only problem was when he came here in 47, there was nowhere to play. Eddie Robinson was our starting first baseman, a power hitter, could hit home runs and drive runs in. Second base was Joe Gordon. Beck had just traded for him a year before, and he wasn't going to sit. Our player manager was a shortstop, and Ken Keltner at third, one of the great third basemen, a six-time All-Star. There was nowhere for Larry to play in the infield. So he sat on the bench, and I thought it was very curious that in September of 48, a pitch hit Eddie Robinson on the ankle and broke it. He couldn't play anymore, and there was two and a half weeks left in the season. That would have been a great opportunity for Boudreaux to put Dolby at first. We weren't going to win the pennant that year. See what he could do. But he chose not to. He kept him on the bench, and Larry hardly played all that year. But during training of 48, from day one, he trained to be an outfielder, to learn how to play the outfield. Tris Speaker was there to help. Hank Greenberg, who was now in the front office working for Bill Beck, was there helping him as well. And by the end of spring training, Larry had proved himself to be a very fine outfielder. He got to start for the ball club, have a really good year, 14 home runs, about 75, 78 RBIs, to be a really excellent player to help us in 48 in our battle for the pennant. Another player that really helped was Gene Bearden, our pitching star of 48. He would win 20 games in his rookie season. Gene was a war veteran. He was a Navy man. In the South Pacific, his boat was torpedoed by the Japanese. After the first hit, he was fine, but he realized some of his buddies were below deck. And he ran down there to try and help and pull some guys up to help them out. And just as he did, another torpedo came flying into the ship, exploded. He was thrown to the side where his skull was split open. His knee was crushed. He was unconscious. He had to be dragged to safety to a lifeboat. He was unconscious for several days. He was in the hospital for months. Had a metal plate put in his knee and in his head. But he made a comeback. He was with the Yankees. And apparently, they didn't think he could still pitch. They traded him to Cleveland as Bill Beck wanted him. He threw a knuckleball, just kind of floated the ball over, and it was very hard to hit. Put no strain on the arm, so he could pitch every two or three days if necessary. And he was a big star for the team in helping us win in 48. It was a tremendous race for the pennant. The Yankees would be involved, Boston would be involved. And Bill Beck knew he needed some more pitching help. Once again, he looked at the Negro Leagues, he signed Satchel Paige from the Kansas City Monarchs to start for him down the stretch in late July, August, and September. A lot of the other Major League owners were just horrified by the decision. They thought, it's a publicity stunt. Satchel Paige is in his 40s. He can't pitch anymore. All Beck is trying to do is put more people in the seats, and that's not right. He should be looking for good ball players. But Beck knew otherwise. 
He brought Satchel into the municipal stadium before he signed him. Boudreaux went there with him. They had a catcher. Satchel threw about 30 balls, almost all strikes. Boudreaux shook his hat, and Satchel was signed. He'd go on to win six out of seven starts down the stretch when Cleveland really needed a fourth starter. Did a tremendous job, and again, helped us win the pennant. And Vec was right in what he had done. He knew Satchel could still pitch. He knew he could help. He signed him to the ball club, and Satchel really was a great aid in winning the pennant in 48. Probably the biggest game of the season, one of the biggest games in Cleveland was August 8th of 1948. The Yankees were in town for a four-game series. This was crucial because the Yankees were right on our tail. We were two games ahead. If we dropped four games, we would be in trouble if we lost three out of four. The Indians had to step up, had to win at least three out of four in the series. Lewis sprained his ankle. He wasn't going to play. He could be seen limping. He didn't look very good at all. And Johnny Berardino was playing shortstop. He became the great actor in General Hospital years later, so he was in the ballgame. The Yankees were killing the Indians in the first game, 6-2, to two, but we rallied in the seventh inning. And the score was 6-4 to four with two out, and everyone wondered what was going to happen. It's a crucial moment in, in the season and in Cleveland history. Boudreaux called time for the dugout. Everybody looked to see Thurman Tucker was going to be the batter, good outfielder, but not a, not a tremendously great hitter. Everyone looked to see what Lou was going to do. People were stunned. There were 73,000 people at the ball game, and Lou comes limping out of the dugout, grabbed the bat, he's going to pinch hit. I think he decided that this is the defining moment of our season right here. Anyone's going to make a break, it's going to be me. I'm going to be the one. Came up the bat, there were deafening applause. All the reporters leaned out of the press box and couldn't believe he was putting himself in the ball game in the state that he was. He could barely put weight on his ankle. He took a pitch, the next one came in. It's a line shot to center field, a base hit, two runs scored to tie the ball game. One of the biggest hits, I think, ever that Cleveland Indian had. It was Lou Boudreaux who came through and did it. The next inning, Eddie Robinson homered. He homered again in the ninth. We win the game eight to six, sweep the doubleheader, and take three out of four from the Yankees and be on our way towards the pennant in 1948. We finished in a tie with Boston. The first time it ever happened in the American League. It had to be a playoff game at Fenway Park. And all the experts thought, well, you have Ted Williams there playing at home, Bobby Doerr, some other big stars. The Sox are going to win it. But Boudreaux pitched Gene Bearden in the big game. He gave up a few hits, a couple runs, but Lou himself hit two home runs. Keltner hit another one. Cleveland won the game 8-3. to three. We were champs of the American League and would play the Boston Braves in the World Series. Everybody knew in game one the pitcher was going to be Bob Feller. He'd never pitched in a World Series. There was no question it would be him. He was up against Johnny Sane, a great pitcher for Boston as well. The game went to the eighth inning with no score. In the bottom of the eighth, the Braves started a rally. They got a runner on first, sacrificed to second. Phil Macy was right in the pitch run in second, and now everything was on the line. The Indians had a really good pickoff play. They'd done all year. They had it down very well. Boudreaux flashed the sign for the pickoff as Macy was leading off a little too far. Fellow would count to two. Turned and fired a second. He threw a strike. Boudreaux got the ball, put the tag on. He's definitely out. But the umpire called him safe. He was a National League umpire who had been warned about the pickoff play, but he wasn't paying attention. He was out of position. He made the safe call. Boudreaux argued and argued and argued, but to no avail, the call stood. And Fellow would lose the game one to nothing. He would never win a World Series game. That was his big chance. Later, when the season ended, Castle Films would record the series film, and they'd have about a 20-minute highlight film you could see. I've had a chance to look at it. It's very clear. You could see Boudreaux putting the tag on Macy, and he's this far from the bag. It's a clear out, but unfortunately, it didn't come to pass. We lost the game. <laughs> However, we would win games two and three. We'd be back in Cleveland. Attendance was out of the roof. They would be getting 78,000, 80,000 for the three games there. And game four was crucial. Steve Gromack got the start. He hadn't pitched in almost two weeks, but he was given the chance. Boudreaux thought, I want to give Feller and Lemon and Beard another day to rest. So Gromek pitched, and he pitched the game of his life. We won the game 2-1. to one. The margin of victory was a long home run by none other than Larry Doby, the first home run ever hit by an African-American in a World Series. Up three games to one, it looked like it was all over. The next day it was Feller pitching. 83,000 people were at the stadium, a total of... 240,000 for three games, another record. People were standing outside the fences, in the tunnel, in the runways. 
Beck wanted to break the all-time record. As soon as he did it, he cut it off right there. As soon as he knew he had it, he wouldn't let any more mm -hmm. people in. We lost the ball game. We had to go back to Boston. We'd come out on top, and we would win the World Series four games to two and be champions of the world. Unfortunately, we're still waiting for another championship. It hasn't mm -hmm. happened since then, but it was such a great time. The guys came back to Cleveland. There was a huge parade down Euclid Avenue. Over 100,000 people were there standing on the sidewalk. Players came by in convertibles, waving to everybody. People were throwing streamers at them, toilet paper rolls, paper, everything. It was one of the great celebrations that we had in Cleveland. We were the champs, finally, and everyone expected We'll repeat in 49 and 50, we have this fabulous team. Young players like Dale Mitchell, Larry Dolby, and others, we're going to be champs for a while. But it didn't happen in 1949. We finished second because Lou Boudreaux got a bit older. So did Ken Keltner and so did Joe Gordon. They didn't have the great seasons they did in 1948. Larry Dolby was a star and so was Dale Mitchell. He had over 200 hits. It wasn't quite enough. We didn't win the championship in 49. While people were mulling that over what had happened gone wrong, they were stunned to hear that Bill Vett had sold the Cleveland Indians. He was leading Cleveland after just three years here. He had built the ball club up from a mediocre team to a champion. People thought he'd be here for a long, long time doing all kinds of wonderful things. But he was gone. It all came down to it. He was divorcing his wife to marry somebody else he had fallen in love with. His wife insisted, as the rules of the divorce, to set up a trust fund for his children. Beck never had any money. He spent every cent he had putting it back in the ball club and his promotions. The only assets he had was his shares in the Cleveland Indians. So he decided, unfortunately, to sell the ball club. He was out of baseball in Cleveland. It was a whirlwind of three years with Beck here and everything that he did. He brought excitement here, fun again to Cleveland baseball, and brought a world championship to Cleveland, which we're still hoping to get another one one of these years. Maybe this year. It's been crazy enough that they might be able to pull it off. But at any rate, he left his mark on Cleveland baseball for a long, long time. Cleveland baseball and baseball in general survived World War II. It was very tough going. There's so many guys gone. A lot of guys played who shouldn't have been in the majors. And to play, the caliber wasn't quite what it used to be. But it did persevere. And for 46 on, baseball regained its glory again as the number one sport in America for many, many years. And life went on. It was a very difficult time in those years. Well, I want to thank you all for your kind attention. If um, anyone has any questions at all or comments, I'd be happy to entertain those. Any questions for Scott? Yes. yes. Uh, just curious, uh, Lou Boudreau was obviously a young guy and all. What was his reason he was deferred from service in the military? Yeah, that, that's a good question. That comes up quite a bit. There was a lot of controversy. Lou had broken his ankle twice. And when he went for his induction and for his exam, he was ruled four out because of the broken ankles. But a lot of people talked about ball players who seemed very healthy playing 150 games a year. Why aren't they the service? And Lou's status was changed to 1A. He went back again for another examination, and a doctor once again turned it around and made him four out because of the ankles. He would not do any military service. And some folks would say and write about it, why can't he just be in the Army and have a desk job? Why can't he uh, drive a Jeep or something like that? What's preventing him from doing that? But somehow, there were people in the right places who decided that Lou was not going to serve, and he didn't. And uh, he did not have anything to do with the war effort. So there was a bit of controversy because, yes, he had a very bad leg. He'd broken it twice. But uh, there were things he could have done in the Army. But he had some doctors there who just uh, ruled against it, and that's, that's what happened. Scott, there's no evidence that he was trying to get special favors? No, not at all. Him. No, that he was doing it himself. He reported for his uh, physical when he was supposed to, but he had the, the ankle problem. And the doctor at the time in 42, I believe, mm -hmm. ruled he was four out. But with a lot of controversy talking about ball players not serving or not uh, doing their duty, his status was changed. And he had to go back to uh, Illinois and be examined again. But the, another, a different doctor this time ruled the same way, that his ankle is not fit for duty and um, he would stay in baseball. Yeah. He would play 150 games but he couldn't be in the Army. So some people are not happy with that because their husbands and their fathers were overseas, and why is, why is he and others playing baseball when they could be doing something? But that, that's what happened. Someone else had their hand up? You know, it's just, yeah. It made me think that there's kind of a relationship between, say, military coordination and baseball coordination, and that they're like putting together these elements of public service and money and all of that. So 
it seemed like they went hand in hand in this case. That, that's that's really true. Some of the owners, they, they knew the uh, people in Washington, the people that had the war jobs, and they stayed in touch frequently, and baseball felt an obligation to do things to help with the war effort because they were still, the owners were still making money, not as much as they used to, but the Yankees and the Giants and Brooklyn always made money and had a surplus, and they thought, we need to do something. And the other owners felt the same way, we need to do things for the soldiers. So they would combine their efforts. Another thing they did was, was um, they set aside one day and they had a competition. These were exhibition games, but they had the White Sox play the Cubs. And they had the Giants play the Yankees, and uh, the Red Sox play the Braves, and the Cardinals play the Browns. And Cleveland had we played Cincinnati, and all the proceeds from all the games went directly to the USO and the Red Cross. They set aside one day to do this. Other times they designate a certain day, and all the proceeds from the games will go to people overseas and uh, help for their families. So I think they felt a op strong obligation. Uh, I think Judge Landis was very pro this and encouraged everyone in baseball to do your part for those overseas those overseas and, and they did and I think that was the other relationship. The other relationship was they always worked with the transportation board because of the spring training of limiting that. They had to work about what can we do and how can we conserve fuel and do our part in doing this, not traveling on trains and, and things along those lines. And as far as coordinating with guys who were drafted and weren't drafted and when they would serve, so there was a, a close relationship between the two with a lot of personnel involved. And I think over the course of the war, I believe the figure was somewhere around five million that was donated, which in the 1940s is a huge amount of money. Probably today, I'm not sure what that would be, 100 million, 120, but the owners were very good about it, so were the players behind, and, and everybody tried to help. There was one point where they uh, actually would do transcripts of a ball game and then wire them overseas. And then people there would type out the game, like play by play, like fly out, by, and they would distribute them to the soldiers. So they would sit in their foxholes or in the jungle and say, look at Brooklyn, we got three runs in the fifth, and they would read all the way through it. They would do this for the guys and try and keep them and do as much as they possibly could for them. Other questions for Scott? Yes? Uh, I thought I had read in one of the many baseball books I've read that uh, the relationship between Larry Doby and uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. no, um, Satchel Page. Oh, Satchel Page. Satchel Page. I'm sorry. Uh, was they weren't hostile towards one another, but that uh, Doby kind of thought that Page didn't take the game as seriously as he should. Uh, is there much truth behind that? Well, they were two different people. Satch was a night owl, so they immediately became roommates when Satch joined the team. Larry would like never see him. Like they would check in the room, and Satch would be out till three, four in the morning. Larry would stay in the room and go to sleep. Uh, Satch, that was his lifestyle, and he was able to do it and still play ball effectively. Effect there were times when Satch uh, was late for practice or something. Or other. He was fine by by Boudreau, but uh, they were two different personalities. Toby was quiet, kind of introspective. Page was a guy that had friends in every city, liked to go out at night, liked to listen to music and do other things. So the two of them, did as roommates, they weren't exactly best friends. I'm sure they, they liked each other, but they were on two different wavelengths as far as, far as their philosophy of baseball and, and how you should live. And Satch was a lot. Satch was probably 41, and Larry was about 24. So it was a big age difference there as well. And, and uh, so they did room together, but yeah, they weren't they weren't the best of friends. They had no animosity. It's just like we're different people, and uh, you know, we don't have a, a whole lot in common. Scott, this 48 team had a lot of huge brand name players. I mean, you talk about Doby, Gordon, Keltner, Boudreau, yeah. Feller, Page. How do you think this rates as one of the you know all-time great single-season teams? I think it's, it's a terrific ball club. I think it should rate up there. I mean, you have Feller, the unanimous Hall of Famer, Bob Lemon as well in the Hall of Fame, Lou Boudreau, and Larry Doby. Dale Mitchell, not a Hall of Famer, but a tremendous ball player. Jim Hegan, one of the best defensive catchers mm -hmm. in the game. So they had their share of really talented guys, and I think this was wasn't an anomaly that they only won one pen in the World Series. They were a great ball club that victim to the Yankees year in, year out. I think we finished second to the Yankees from 49 to 53. Then we won the pen at 54, then went to the Yankees, but then nobody could beat the Yankees. But I think they really are one of the better teams. The guy, that pitching staff was tremendous. You had three starters, I think won about 60 games between them. Uh, Steve Gromack was an excellent fifth starter. Satchel Page, a Hall of Famer, was also the spot starter. These were really good ball players. Joe Gordon, 
another one. Only played here for a few years, but really tremendous. And Ken Keltner, not a Hall of Famer, but seven-time All-Star, six-time All-Star, great glove man. And so this was really a talented ball club that I think sometimes gets shortchanged because of just the one, one pen and one World Series. The book is Victory on Two Fronts, the Cleveland Indians in Baseball Through the World War II Era. Uh, it's really insightful a look at baseball uh, throughout the 1940s, in particular during the war. Uh, we want to thank Scott Longert for joining us here at the Hall of Fame Conference. And those of you with us here in the Bullpen Theater, if you would like to join us in the atrium, uh, Scott is going to sign books. He'll be happy to answer any other questions you want to ask, and certainly happy to sign copies of his book, Victory on Two Fronts. So please join us in the atrium. Thanks again, Scott. Thank you. My pleasure, really.